Good morning. Welcome to the 2020 Almond Conference in the session titled Navigating U.S. Goods Return, FDA Insights. We're happy you could join us here today to hear tips from two FDA import directors on how to navigate the goods return process. My name is Tim Birmingham. I'm the Director of Quality Assurance and Industry Services at the Almond Board of California, having worked for the Almond Board since 2007. I will be serving as today's moderator uh, for both the session and the live Q&A to follow. Our first speaker today is Gordon Chu. Gordon is the Active Program Division Director in the Division of West Coast Imports with FDA. Gordon has been with FDA since 2002, starting as a consumer safety officer involved in domestic food inspection and import investigational work, among other duties. In his current role, he oversees investigation branch operations, including import, sa import sample collection, entry review, investigation and inspection of imported FDA regulated products, including almonds. Our second speaker is Lawton Lum. Lawton joined FDA in 1990 as a consumer safety officer. In that role, he conducted inspections of medical device manufacturers, both domestically and internationally. In 2003, Lawton became a compliance officer for the San Francisco district, handling both domestic and import casework. In 2012, he was selected to become the compliance, the director of compliance for the San Francisco branch. And in 2017, he received his assignment to his current position after the FDA's Office of Regulatory Affairs reorganized its organizational structure. And we'll hear more about that today from Gordon. So just a few tips for a successful session today. I would definitely encourage you all to use the chat feature or the live Q&A or the Q&A um, during the session to ask questions during the session. Um, I will be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat, um, and we may answer some of the questions actually during the session. Um, also, please make sure to join us after the session uh, in the lounge for live Q&A with both Gordon and Lawton, and this will be immediately following the session. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions um, live in person. Alternatively, if you don't feel comfortable asking questions live, you can email those to me um, and I'll be happy to, to follow up with both Gordon and Lawton after. Um, in addition, we are going to be preparing a Q&A fact sheet based on questions that, that have been asked and answered by both Gordon and Lawton. So why are we still talking about the goods return process? You know, we know the industry is doing a great job of maintaining high quality. Um, and this translates directly to the number of goods returned to the U.S., particularly as it relates to aflatoxin. And as we've seen the past couple of years, the numbers have been decreasing, which is great. The industry really is doing a good job of controlling the level of aflatoxin in the product um, and really focusing on, on insect uh, control, which is translated into lower levels of aflatoxin. However, with all raw agricultural commodities, there are variations from year to year which can lead to an increase in the number of rejections uh, due to aflatoxin exceedances in various countries. And we understand that despite the best efforts, there will always be a certain level of unavoidable defects, which will translate to some lots being returned here to the U.S. Uh, also, as the crop grows in size, we would anticipate um, that, that the number of rejections would keep pace with industry growth. So despite best efforts, and we understand that there are a certain unavoidable level of defects, which will translate to a certain number of goods returned to the U.S. each year. We also understand that any product back, brought back to the U.S. Um, must meet U.S. regulatory requirements, and FDA does indeed treat almonds that are returned to the U.S. as imports coming into the country. So, you know, last year at the conference, uh, we really focused on providing the industry some guidance on how to bring the lots back to the U.S. Uh, we talked about um, some of the critical goods return steps. Um, the first one being, you know, how to get the product back into the U.S., um, the role of the goods return letter uh, issued by the Almond Board of California, working with a customs um, broker to bring the product back, and then preparing for the FDA detention notice in advance so that you could quickly address it once it did indeed arrive. Uh, we also talked about the second important step being engaging with FDA, um, sharing information with FDA, asking questions so that you could properly address 
any detention notice um, and, and build in any requirements into your reconditioning plan. And then the third important step, we talked about how to effectively carry out reconditioning um, and how to build out that reconditioning plan um, and work with FDA to make sure that it met their needs to ensure the level of, of food safety here in the United States. Uh, for this session today, we really wanted to bring in the FDA insight. Uh, we wanted to, to actually hear from FDA um, on some of the, the tips that they could provide to help us to navigate this process uh, easier. So for today's talk, uh, what I've asked Gordon and Lawton to focus on really is the organizational structure within FDA, the role of the compliance and investigational branch branches within the division of West Coast Imports. Um, so I wanted to, to delineate the compliance versus the investigation side, um, which sometimes causes confusions when bringing product back into the U.S. Um, I've asked them to talk about the, the importation process. I've asked them to share practical steps involved in bringing the goods back to the U.S. Um, I've also asked them to illuminate the FDA notification process, um, what might be expected by a handler who's bringing product in, what type of notification might they receive from FDA. And then I've also asked them to share some insights into what a successful reconditioning plan looks like. Um, and then finally, I've asked FDA, you know, to, to highlight any things to be mindful of to avoid delays or refusals once the product is brought back in, into the U.S. Um, and, and then I'd just like to remind everyone again, um, after the session today, you know, please do visit us in the live lounge for, uh, for Q&A. Um, but at any time during the talk today, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A to ask questions. We'll try to answer some of those or we'll bring those over into the Q&A lounge with us afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to, to go ahead and get started uh, and turn it over to Gordon Chu. Hello everyone, my name is Gordon Chu and I'm currently the Acting Program Division Director for FDA's Division of West Coast Import under the acronym DWCI. Today, I'm going to co-present with Lon Lum, who is the Director of Compliance Branch for DWCI. In our presentation today, we are going to really highlight our organizational structure, geographic and branch responsibility, the import importation process, and also to provide an overview of our compliance. Over the years, the products that FDA regulates have become more complicated the markets are, are much more numerous and the rules governing the agency's actions are much more complex right now. The FDA's operational model needs to continue to adapt to a lot of these challenges and we need, really need to improve efforts to protect public health. In order to do that, FDA implemented a change in operation named Program Alignment, which plans to modernize and really strengthen its workforce to improve public health responses in a way that really keeps pace with the acceleration of scientific innovation, global expansion of markets, and new programmatic mandates. So on May 15, 2017, a new FDA organizational structure was built. It is a program-based management structure that aligns staff by FDA-regulated products. Specializing by FDA-regulated products try type more closely mirrors the organizational model of FDA center and industries we regulate. DWCI falls under the umbrella of the Office of Enforcement and Import Operation, OEIO, which is the acronym. OEIO, in this case, provides direction, assistance, management, and have a, a really a national oversight of field import operation, including investigational and compliance activities. In addition, it serves as the agency's focal point for headquarters and field relationship on all import programs. It is OEIO that coordinates agency import activities with U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or what we know as CBP, other federal agencies and foreign governments with border responsibilities. With the addition of the Division of Food Defense Targeting, or what we call DFDT, OEIO liaisons with law enforcement agencies to obtain and respond to intelligence to intelligence concerning potentially hazardous human and animal food products destined to be offered for import into the United States. OEIO field operation is covered by five import divisions. 
The Division of Northern Border Imports covers states that touches the Canadian border. The Division of Southwest Imports covers states and area that touches the Mexican border. The Division of Northeast Imports covers areas that are at located near the Northeast part of the United States, minus the trucking borders, which has crossing locations that cover the Northern border. The Division of Southeast Imports covers areas that are in the Southeast part of the United States, but it also includes Alaska and the express consignment carrier facility operations. Now, my division, the Division of West Coast Import, DWCI, covers air and seaport operation in the states of Washington, Oregon, Hawaii, Nevada, and California. DWCI employees are spread among the five states with 15 different resident pulses, two centralized examination stations or CES sites, and three international mill facilities, or we call IMF. DWCI's main import operation office is currently located in Long Beach, California. There are two main branches in DWCI, the investigations branch and the compliance branch. The investigations branch is managed by our director of investigations branch, and the compliance is managed by the director of compliance branch. The investigation branch comprises of around 12 supervisors and around also 100 investigators. The compliance branches consist of two supervisors and 19 compliance officers. Our investigators are responsible for sample collection, field examination, investigation, inspections, refusal examinations, file evaluation, and also the electronic review of imported regulated product. You can call them really the eyes and ears of FDA. Our compliance officers are responsible for processing a lot of the back end of the work um, being produced by our investigators. They are the individuals who detain and refuse uh, shipments, review your reconditioning proposal, and can initiate criminal cases with our Office of Criminal Investigations. Next, I really want to talk about the process of trying to get your products into the United States. First, it's important to know that imported shipments of FDA regulated product must comply with the same standard as domestic products. Just to emphasize, this includes labeling requirements, which seems to be a recurring problem or issue that FDA have observed on, on the importation end. Products may be refused emission into the US if they are adulterated or misbranded. In this type of scenario, the importer can, can work with FDA to see if the product can be brought into compliance by going through a reconditioning process. This is where you will have to work with our compliance officers. If the product is refused by FDA, the importer has the option to either destroy or export it from the United States within 90 days. The next is that we're going to look into the general import process. Product offered for entry into the United States must be declared to CBP or the, or the U.S. Customs Border Protection. Many importers choose to hire licensed representative called customs brokers or entry filers. These brokers submit entry information and payments to CBP on behalf of the importer through the automated commercial environment, which the CBP known as ACE. CBP then refers those FDA regulated products to, um, to FDA for review. Entries undergoing an initial risk-based screening through FDA's predict system, this is the electronic screening. Food entries are additionally screened by the Defense of Food, the Division of Food Defense Targeting or DFPT. Uh, per the Bioterrorism Act, FDA requires prior notification of entry of imported food in order to protect the public from an attack on the U.S. food supply. So the FDT does have a very big responsibility in doing a lot of the initial screening. After an initial electronic review, a further review is required. Entries are manually reviewed by an entry reviewer. FDA may send an investigator can, to conduct a field examination or sample collection. Upon completion, of exams, entry may be referred to compliance for further review. But please note that imported products may not be distributed into U.S. commerce unless you get an admissibility decision or unless until an admissibility decision is made. Our investigators really work diligently and intelligently when they conduct their field examination. They take really great pride in their work in protecting the public health. When when FDA investigator collects samples, we want to make sure it is done in a timely manner so that it can be sent to an FDA lab for analysis as soon as possible. 
This is where the investigation branch really passes the baton over to the compliance branch, who will help monitor the lab results and also provide a final admissibility decision. Now, to really provide more insight into this process, Lautenum, our director of compliance branch, will explain and go over the compliance process related to what their compliance officer actually do. So, Lawton, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. So who are we? Compliance officers review information collected by our field investigators based on collected evidence and information an admissibility decision is made based on federal regulations and law. If a violation is found, we seek voluntary compliance from the importer of record. FDA's import authority is defined in section 801A of the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. The burden of proof is low for imported products. If the product appears to be in violation of our regulation, it shall be refused emission. The type of actions and or notifications an importer will receive from the compliance branch are a notice of release, notice of detention, meaning a violation was identified past or present, notice of refusal, if the violation cannot be corrected or overcome. The notice of detention will provide detailed information covering the violation found. If the violation is not fully addressed, the entry will be refused admission. The notice will identify a respond by date and will provide the name and contact information of the compliance officer handling the import entry. Options for the importer, contest or challenge the violation, recondition the product to bring into compliance, request refusal. Please note, if no response is received by the identified respond by date, the entry will be refused emission. If reconditioning is being proposed to bring a product into compliance, an application to the compliance officer shall be submitted. The reconditioning activity needs to be detailed and specific, such as an equipment list and how each equipment will be used in the reconditioning process, step-by-step -step process, for example, sorting, washing, re-roasting, time and temperature values if applicable. If reconditioning involves micro or filth contamination, what will be performed to verify the reconditioning process was effective in the removal of the contamination? Again, an example may be a third-party testing. If reconditioning process results in rejected products, FDA will need to know its final disposition of the material will be destroyed. If reprocessed, what will be the specific steps? If the reconditioning plan is found acceptable, FDA will provide a written response. It is important to read FDA's response as it will clearly discuss the conditions FDA is allowing. FDA may add to or identify needed adjustments to the proposed process. The reconditioning activity may require FDA supervision and it will provide a time limit to complete the proposed activity. If FDA's action was taken on the appearance of a violation, the importer can provide evidence that the product is not in violation. For example, alpha toxin levels found in almonds overseas resulting in the return of US goods may be overturned with the submission of a private laboratory result. 
If additional time is needed outside of the original respond by date, an extension of time may be requested. However, the request shall be made within 10 days of the original detention notice. The request should indicate a detailed resolution is being pursued, like hiring a private lab. After reconditioning, the product will be released or refused. Upon the issuance of the notice of refusal, it is considered the final action of the FDA. Customs and Border Protection will issue a demand to re-deliver the entry. At that point, the importer may destroy or export the entry by filing the appropriate Customs and Border Protection form. If the importer fails to comply with Customs and Border Protection's demand to re-deliver the goods, it may be fined three times the value of the goods. Important reminders, always read the notice as there may be additional information noted in the comments. If reconditioning is denied, the importer gets two attempts. Pay close attention to the respond by date. If reconditioning, ensure the 766 is returned and signed. If you are seeking status of the entry, you may go to ITAX, I-T-A-C-S, at FDA.gov. ITAX also allows you to submit testimony to the compliance officers, such as written testimony, written correspondences, emails, and or third-party testing results. If you, are, if you are unable to reach the identified compliance officer, the best method to reach us is to send an email to wcid at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you for your attention. All right, so I'd just like to thank Gordon and Lawton for those very informative presentations. You know, a couple things that I picked up on um, that are very important is, you know, number one, you have to respond to an FDA notification in a timely manner. Um, if you do not respond within the time allotted, um, the only thing that FDA can do is to issue a refusal notice. And at that point, um, the product has to be returned to customs. Um, the second point that I picked up on is the reconditioning plans have to be very, very detailed. Um, you have to make sure you address all of the steps um, in great length as to you know, what you're actually doing to the product. Um, and then finally, you know, when you submit your reconditioning plan, it's very important that you work with FDA um, to address any deficiencies in that plan. FDA will respond, and oftentimes they'll respond with, with what, in a, what additional needs to be done um, to the product. So you need to really pay attention to that FDA response to make sure you've adequately captured um, what they've required as well. Uh, so with that, um, I again would like to thank both Gordon and Lawton for their time. Uh, in this session today. Uh, we're not quite done yet. We've got the opportunity for a live Q&A. We've already received um, a number of questions. So if you please join us in the Q&A session, um, we'll go ahead and we'll get started on answering those questions. Again, thank you very much for joining us in the session today. Look forward to um, chatting with you live uh, in, in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. And again, thank you, um, Lawton and Gordon, for uh, for your presentations and for being here with us today to, to spend some time to answer some questions. Um, so I do see some, some questions that have come into the, the Q&A um, uh, chat box here. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and we'll get started. So the first question I see, I think, um, I think is probably for you, Gordon. Um, and the question is, what happens okay. when a load of almonds is okay. returned for failing aflatoxin testing in the EU. Um, if it meets US regulations, if it's failed in the EU at less than 20 part per billion, so something, let's say 15 part per billion, um, that's still within US regulations. So what what is FDA's position 
in regards to product that's returned that meets U.S. regulations, but it's failed in a foreign country. Good morning, everyone. And actually, that's a really good question. One one of the things what we do, um, or what the investigations branch would do, is that, and we and we do this to a lot of these U.S. goods returned. We do examine it. We do not only the electronic examination of these products via the um, via our entry reviewers. We will, the interviewers will help make a determine whether we need to go out there to do a physical exam. So we will evaluate each entry on its own merit, not only almonds, but peanuts and other different products. When we see that, it normally will trigger us to think about or what the investigator will think about looking to sample the product just to verify. We trust, but we also want to verify the level of aflatoxin. So that will most likely trigger a sample collection our end. To take a look to take it do a deeper dive into it but a lot of that determination is based on the documentation being provided the um the recommendation from our predict targeting system and that's a lot of it really front loaded by our entry reviewers then when we send our investigators out there to do the actual physical examination from the field they will make that determination and based on their best judgment to see if it, if it needs to be sampled or not but a lot of it is really examining the evidence and document up front Hopefully that answered your questions. Yeah, um, that, that does, thank you. Um, I, I think as a follow-up, one of the questions that we have is, you know, is, is does product that's returned, um, does it always require, you know, additional aflatoxin testing or, or reconditioning? So, you know, how does FDA make that determination? I know all goods returned to the U.S. are treated as, as imports, um, but if a, a good is, return, you know, does FDA, you know, sometimes not require reconditioning and solely just require, you know, additional aflatoxin testing? I think maybe, um, maybe Lawton, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take it. Uh, <clears throat> I hope it's not my computer, but I'm hearing a lot of uh, feedback. Um, so the, <clears throat> the question is, if the product is returned and it's under the 20 parts per billion for all aflatoxins, it, it all depends on the detention, if it needs to be reconditioned or not. If it was detained for aflatoxins and the level is actually below FDA's action level, you may want to communicate with the compliance officer to make sure that that critical part of that information was not missed. However, if there's other types of possible violations involved that's not aflatoxins related, there may be reconditioning may be appropriate and further uh, verification that the product is now in compliance after reconditioning uh, would be considered for a FDA release. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. so um, that does. And I see there is a question in the chat about uh, communicating with FDA. And um, so, as you just mentioned, you know, sometimes you do need to um, work with the compliance officer to seek d additional information. What is the best way uh, for a handler to do that? Is it, you know, an email, picking up the phone? I know you mentioned the ITAC system. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that as well? Sure. Yeah, the best, inf the best way to communicate is to the compliance officer. Uh, the compliance officer's name, contact information is identified on the FDA notice of detention. Uh, however, if we do use the ITAX, uh, which is a trade portal, it's, it's a very neat tool to use in that when the, if the compliance officer is out of the office, and there is a compliance officer that is backing up that individual's work, the information that you submit through ITAX 
will be able to be reviewed by the compliance officer that is covering the original compliance officer's detention. On top of that, if the compliance officer is in the office, by submitting it to ITAX, they get real-time notification that a that a, a testimony or private lab or email communication has been uploaded into that particular entry. Uh, so they will have that in their queue to address. So there's many methods to communicate with us. Uh, compliance officer's email, the compliance officer's phone number, do ITAX, again, ITAX is I-T-A-C-S dot FDA dot GOV, or if, or if everything else fails, communicate with us by a general email address at uh, DWCI at FDA dot GOV. Okay, great. And um, I think we'll we'll capture that in a, a written document. We'll put together a Q&A after this, this session that um, will include some of that contact information. So that's great. Thank you, Lawton. Um, you know, I do see another question here in the chat, and this comes up from time to time, you know, a little bit of confusion around when, when can a handler take that product um, if there's a detention notice that's been issued, when can they actually take possession of that product um, so that they can can go ahead and recondition the product. You know, so when when can it um, be be moved after it's clear customs, but a detention notice has been issued? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Once the detention is issued, um, you really don't have. Uh, you really need to uh, communicate with the compliance officer first to ensure that the reconditioning proposal is acceptable before you uh, process any type of reconditioning. You wanna make sure that your proposal is accepted and it is done under the specific criteria that's identified by the compliance officer. Okay. Um, all right, I see a question that's come in in the, the Q&A, so um, from one of our Almond handlers. So what are, um, this is a general question, uh, what are some of the common mistakes with reconditioning plans which cause delays in FDA response or approval? Not sure if, um, Gordon, if you want to try to take that one or, or Lawton. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. And I assume the question okay. is the reconditioning process. Uh, make sure that the proposal is complete. Make sure that it addresses the segregation of uh, acceptable versus rejected products. One of the major holdups we see on a reconditioning plan is if the rejected material will be diverted to animal feed. Uh, animal feed is covered by the Center of Veterinarian Medicine. Under the FISMA rule, there's strict requirements for for animal feed. There's a large questionnaire that needs to be completed for CVM to consider rejected products being diverted for animal food. So make sure you do communicate with the compliance officer and they can get you that information for what you need to complete. Uh, another main problem that we see is reconditioning plans without validation method. So make sure the reconditioning has been vetted through, that it can scientifically remove the aflatoxins, uh, and, and make sure that uh, you do reconfirm 
after reconditioning that the product is now in compliance. So however that method may be, most likely a private lab, uh, make sure the private lab is aware of FDA's policies and procedures. Uh, we require a um, representative sample. We, we require clear documentation of the sample collection. We require a list of equipment. We require the certification of the of the analyst that is performing the test method. So there's a lot of information there that needs to be addressed. If you are new to the importation uh, or re-importation of almonds, make sure you do communicate with the compliance officer to ask these general questions. And we will be happy to address all the information that we would need to review a reconditioning proposal. So Lawton, I, I see a question that um, that came up while you were speaking. I think you, you partially answered this, but for aptotoxin testing, um, you know, why why does or does the laboratory have to submit a lengthy analytical data packet? And then I guess the the why part of the question is, you know, if we're using USDA approved laboratories. Um, for aflatoxin testing, you know, why would they still need to submit such a lengthy data packet um, along with the analysis? Yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. Um, one of the key things is we need to ensure that the private lab or the laboratory that's performing the test is equivalent to FDA's uh, method. So it replaces FDA from going out there to collect the product. They're interesting on the USDA front. Yes, they are a accredited laboratory. However, USDA only has an MOU with FDA for filth. We currently do not have an MOU in place for microtoxins. So therefore, we treat USDA as a third-party third laboratory where we need the complete analytical package. So as, as a follow-up to that, Lawton, if a, if a laboratory um, has been used one time and submitted the complete analytical package, is that something that's required every time, or can you use some of that information that's been previously shared? Yes, you may use previous information just such as um, the CV of the of the the uh, the the person performing the the method, uh, the equipment list. Uh, so a lot of the information the laboratory will provide in their complete package. And our Office of Regulatory Science has a lot of that background information already. However, we do require complete package because each entry is treated independently. But if there's background information that we can use, uh, it, would be, it would be evaluated by our Office of Regulatory Science. Okay. Um, just a, another follow up to that. Would it would it be safe to say that you know any product that has been reconditioned, you would require aflatoxin testing in in most cases? Is that a fair statement? Uh, Tim, you're going to have to repeat that. Um, I could not hear that question. Yeah. Yeah. So so the question, Lawton, was if if you've um, you recondition the product, so you submitted a reconditioning plan and you successfully implemented that plan. Would it be safe to say that the final step in that plan is most likely going to be aflatoxin testing? So in other words, um, FDA is not likely to accept a reconditioning plan that doesn't include aflatoxin testing as kind of that final check. Is that is that an accurate statement? Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback, but I think the question was if a reconditioning plan was previously submitted for aflatoxin testing, 
and it was found acceptable and there was no changes made to the plan i most likely it would be considered acceptable to follow that same plan however we do need to see the analytical package to demonstrate that the product uh Af total aflatoxin level was found below our action lim limit, which is 20 ppbs. Okay. Yeah, I apologize if you're all hearing feedback. Um, we're working through um, a couple technical issues, I think. So hopefully um, you and the audience can hear us as we're, we're working through this. Um, let's see. It looks like maybe we've got just a couple more questions. Um, there is a there is a question that just came in as you were speaking, Lawton. Is there a way for a laboratory to be recognized as an FDA equivalent for aflatoxin testing? No, we don't. Uh, we don't approve of any private laboratories. We. We do require private laboratories to understand FDA's requirements. Uh, we are a government agency, so we cannot really endorse one third party lab over another. Okay. And let's see, I see a, a follow up question as well. Um, and I, I know there's, there's MOUs in place. You mentioned filth, and I, I I understand that there's also one for um, for other nuts that are imported um, into the U.S. for USDA to do some of the testing. But the question here is, might there be an MOU implemented with the USDA in the future on mycotoxin analysis, or is there aren't any current discussions on this by the agencies? Um, there, there has been discussion. Uh, I don't know where we are in that process. That is really handled by our FDA headquarters office. So I do not have a current status of where we are uh, in that discussion with USDA. Hi, okay. Tim, this is Gordon. If you can email me that particular question, I can follow up sure. with our Office of Partnership just to see what are some of the dialogues involved in that, if that information can be shared. So thank you, Tim. Yeah, that'll be great. We'll, we'll definitely do that. So I, I think, um, oh, I see a couple more questions here in the chat. So um, what one of the, the questions that came in, and I think this is in regards to maybe the animal feed, but um, what are the acceptable options for disposal of rejected material produced during reconditioning? So the acceptable options for rejected products is destruction, sending it to a landfill or exportation of those rejected products. If they are not Great. being diverted to for animal feed. All right, well, very good. I believe that's, um, that's all the questions that we have at this point. So um, I'd like to, you know, again, thank everyone for joining us here for this session today. We will be um, putting together a list of these questions that have been asked and we'll, we'll put it together in a Q&A format. Um, and then we'll also include uh, both Gordon and Lawton's contact information and some of the other uh, contacts that they shared as well. Um, so again, I would just like to thank Lawton and Gordon for um, spending that time to be here with us today. Um, I know, you know, doing this remotely has been a little bit more difficult than if we were in person, but I think it was still a very successful session and I um, really appreciate your time today, both, both Gordon and Lawton. So thank you very much. Um, also appreciate everyone spending this time with us here, um, asking these great questions and you know, working on this very important issue for the almond industry. We'll put this together in a Q&A document and we'll make this available um, after the conference. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Really appreciate your time here with us today. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Tim.